Okay, in this lecture I'd like to explore the topic of angular eigenfunctions. Now, as explained, there were three angular momentum operators in the three Cartesian directions. So the angular momentum along the x-axis is described by an operator Lx. The angular momentum along the y-axis is described by an operator Ly and around the z-axis by the angular momentum operator Lz. And when one takes the commutator between two of the operators, one generates the third operator multiplied by the complex factor ih bar. So they do not commute with each other. The commutation of two operators generates a third operator and one can cyclically permute the symbols um, to go from x to y to z and generate another relationship. Then one defines the operator called L squared. In words, the total square angular momentum operator, which is defined as the sum of the squares of the three components. And this operator commutes with all three of the angular momentum component operators. So we have L squared Lx is L squared Ly is zero. So L squared commutes with all three of the x, y, and z operators. So when two operators commute, it's possible to choose a function which is an eigenfunction of both of the commuting operators. And by convention in angular momentum theory, one concentrates on the commutation of the Lz and the L squared operators and defines um, eigenfunctions of both of these operators at the same time. And using the Dirac notation, these eigenfunctions are denoted through the symbol ket LML, where the two quantum numbers here, L and ML, define the eigenvalues of the operator L squared and Lz respectively. So for example, the, the function ket LML is defined as an eigenfunction of the L squared operator. An eigenfunction means that when we apply the operator we get the same function back again multiplied by a number which is called the eigenvalue. And in the case of L squared, this eigenvalue depends only on the value of L and in fact it's given by h bar squared L L plus 1. Similarly, the same eigenfunction is defined to be an eigenfunction of the operator Lz with which L squared commutes. So again we have an eigen relationship in which the operator applied to the eigenfunction gives the same function multiplied by a number which in this case depends only on ml and in fact is given by h bar ml. So the quantum number L determines the eigenvalue of L squared and the quantum number ml determines the eigenvalue of Lz. These quantum numbers have conventional names. L is simply called the angular momentum quantum number and it takes integer values 0, 1, 2 going up to infinity. And ml is conventionally called the magnetic quantum number or sometimes the azimuthal quantum number and the values it takes depend on the value of L. So it takes values from plus L going down in steps of 1 until you hit minus L or in other words from minus L up to plus L in steps of 1 and there are two L plus 1 such values. So for example if L is 0 then ML has to be 0 if L is 1, then ML can be either plus 1, 0, or minus 1. If L is 2, then ML 
can take one of the five values, plus two, one, zero, minus one, minus two. Now let's look at these functions explicitly. These functions are called spherical harmonics. The eigenfunctions of the angular momentum operators and spherical harmonics are the same things. The function which in Dirac notation is described as a ket, defined by the quantum numbers L and ML, is identical to the spherical harmonic function which is usually denoted as follows. The subscripts are given by these same quantum numbers as used in the Dirac ket notation and they depend on the polar angles theta and phi. The polar angles are just a way of um, defining a direction in space so conventionally point in space may be described by the distance from the origin of the three-dimensional coordinate system by the angle between the vector joining the point of the origin and the z-axis that's the polar angle theta and if one projects the um, the vector onto the xy plane then one can define the angle phi which is the angle of that vector in the xy plane so this these two angles theta and phi define a, a, um, a direction in space and it's convenient to define a function which depends on that direction in space. Here we see the mathematical forms of those uh, of some of those spherical harmonics. As you can see they depend on the polar angles theta and phi. They're given by some usually some complicated numbers. We'll see where those numbers come from in a minute. And then some trigonometric or exponential functions of the angles theta and phi. And you can see that for the functions with ML not equal to zero, then these are complex functions. So we have forms of the type e to the i phi, e to the minus i phi, and so on. Uh, it's possible to plot those functions uh, graphically. And the real parts of those functions look like this. Remember, the functions are complex, so it's hard to get a, a full picture of what the functions look like using a plot because it's not so easy to represent complex numbers graphically. There are different ways of doing that but here we're just showing the real functions. And for those familiar with atomic theory then one can see that these are simply equal to the angular parts of the atomic orbitals. So the functions with L is zero is just a sphere, it's just one function, uh, like an S orbital there are three functions with L is 1, depending on the value of ML, and these look like p orbitals. The L equals 2, the five functions with L equals 2 look like d orbitals, and so on. Now these functions are normalized. Mathematically what that means is that if I take one of these functions and I take its complex conjugate, which means changing the sign of any factors involving i, the square root of minus 1, if I multiply that by itself, if I integrate over all values of theta, and if I integrate over all values of phi, then one gets 1. So that's called normalization. The, the integral of a function multiplied by itself with complex conjugate, in the case that it's complex, and integrate over all values of theta and phi, then we get 1. That's called normalization. The functions are also orthogonal, which means if I do the same operation, so I take one of these spherical harmonics, take the complex conjugate, and multiply by one of the functions with different values of quantum numbers L and ML, and again integrate over all values of theta and phi, then I get zero if L is not equal to L prime or ML not equal to ML prime. So in other words the the integral of the product of the functions, complex conjugate for one of them, integrated over all values of the polar angles, all directions of space, becomes zero if the functions are different. Now this uh, notation using uh, integrals is, is cumbersome. It's much more convenient to use Dirac notation to denote this relationship. 
In Dirac notation, one defines the bra function, which is written like this. This is just the complex conjugate of the ket function. And then we can write these two relationships in a very concise way as follows. We write the Dirac bracket bra ket, where this implies this integration operation as shown here. And very concisely, we, one can write the orthogonality and the normalization relationship using a symbol called the Kronecker delta. So this symbol is called Kronecker delta and has the very simple meaning. It has two subscripts, delta A, B. The Kronecker delta is defined to be zero if A is not equal to B and one if A equals to B. So by using two Kronecker deltas, we ensure that the product is zero if either L is not equal to L prime or if ML is not equal to ML prime. So this Dirac notation replaces these complicated integral symbols and makes it much easier to see what's going on. So this relationship here defines the orthogonality and the normalization of the spherical harmonics, the angular momentum eigenfunctions. And when we put normalization and orthogonality together, we um, can say that they're orthonormal. So this defines the relationship called orthonormality. So we can say the set of functions, ket, LML, are orthonormal.